following is my conversation with Stuart Hamroth. Stuart is an anesthesiologist by profession and he has been working on a theory of consciousness for a little over three decades now. Stuart is an original voice. His focus is more on what is the physical mechanism of conscious subjective experience. In my conversation with Stuart, it comes across that Stuart is a physicalist. He believes in a physical substrate. He believes in quantum mechanics. And he's also, a, in that sense, by extension, a panpsych panpsychist, meaning, you know, there is proto-consciousness at every level. So how consciousness gets realized as a physical mechanism, that is what we talk about. And he has been working with Nobel laureate Roger Penrose for the past several decades to have their quantum mechanics based theory of consciousness. There is a physical mechanism within certain neuronal cells that Stuart refers to it as Bing. So this conversation with Stuart is about his journey, his pursuit, the phenomenon of Bing. Uh, this is a very uh, scientific chat. We talk about physics, quantum mechanics, competition, and we certainly anesthesia, and we stay away from the uh, many popular hand wave theories of consciousness. Um, Stuart is an original, humble voice. We also, amongst other things, uh, talk about consciousness engineering, how to think about engineering consciousness in machines, and what would that look like, how to start that journey, and much, much more. I had a lot of fun, as you would see shortly, having this conversation. I hope you're going to find it uh, joyful and very useful. Uh, I know that Stuart has a large sort of fan falling and you know all that good stuff. Uh, it's amazing to see that he's an active researcher uh, and a practicing anesthesiologist. When I spoke with him a few weeks ago, uh, he just came out from a surgery. Uh, so anyways, uh, I have a lot of respect for Stuart. Uh, anesthesia is probably the best way to understand what consciousness is because it disturbs that rhythm. Uh, it disturbs that synchrony uh, that we call or we experience as, you know, felt quality that's private inner life, that subjective experience. Okay, uh, now here is my conversation with none other than Stuart Hamroth. I'm uh, very well. I'm glad good to see you again. How you doing? Very, very likewise. No, thank you. And thanks for taking time today to, uh, you know, uh, share your uh, thoughts and wisdom with us and uh, I'm so, so looking forward to uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, so we'll get, you know, we'll get, we'll get right into it. Uh, so let's start with how, uh, Stuart, you see Charmer's uh, hard problem and what does it mean to you? And when you think about qualia and experience, you know, certainly it's all very personal to each one of us, but what does, sir, it mean to you and how you're thinking of uh, the hard problem, which came in your Tucson conference, which now is an institute in its own reference. Uh, that is kind of how it all got started. Uh, but I think for our uh, 
neuroscientist audience and for the cognitive psychologist audience, but more importantly also, Stuart, for the software engineering audience, uh, let's unpack it a little bit. Well, I, I believe in the hard problem. I don't think consciousness is an illusion. I don't think it's a natural consequence of computation or complexity. I think it's something different and special, which is what Chalmers uh, intended, I think. And other people had said it uh, in similar ways before him, uh, Nagel and Searle and, and, and going back many others. But um, uh, it's not, uh, qualia conscious experience is not a natural product of computation. And uh, I came to this uh, uh, kind of the hard way because I had spent uh, 20 years on the idea that looking at the brain as a computer of individual neurons, with each neuron being an integrated and fire uh, threshold logic device connected up with variable strength synapses um, could explain consciousness. I didn't think that was true. I think you needed to go to a deeper level to the microtubules, which give you a much greater capacity for information processing. For example, a single cell organism like a paramecium swims around, it finds food, it finds a mate, it has sex, it can learn. And it does so without any synaptic connections. It's just one cell. Well, if that was the case, if that's the case, then how could a neuron, I mean, it, it's uh, a neuron to be a simple uh, threshold logic device is kind of an insult to yeah. neurons. Um, they're much more complicated. Uh, single cell organisms like amoeba can solve the traveling salesman problem just by putting out these pseudopods that are driven by its microtubules. So I had uh, gotten into microtubules in medical school in the 1970s, and uh, particularly in mitosis and how they separated chromosomes and knew where to put them precisely. And their very uh, precise orchestrated uh, movements uh, seem to indicate some kind of intelligence or onboard computer function of these microtubules. And about that time in the early 70s, I also uh, discovered that, well, I didn't discover, but it was discovered that they were um, in neurons too, because the fixative agent for uh, microtubules and cytoskeletal proteins for the electron micros uh, microscope had been dissolving them for 30 years. And the inside of neurons and other cells looked like a, a soup, everything swimming around in a liquid, when actually it was discovered that there's a solid state system, the cytoskeleton and other uh, 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 microtubules, filaments, act, neurofilaments, actin and so forth, centrioles. There was this uh, highly organized uh, ordered uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, it was organizing things within the cell, including neurons. And, uh, and the X-ray uh, uh, diffraction uh, crystallography showed that microtubules were lattices, lattice polymers, and I was learning a little bit about com computers back then. And, and I said, well, maybe microtubules are acting like a computer. And each of these, each of their subunits, these uh, proteins called tubulin, could be in, in one state or another state and interact with neighbors and process information like a computer or a cellular automaton. And that would increase the information capacity of the brain tremendously. Uh, Kurzweil, well, this came later, but Kurzweil and AI were saying, Actually, Hans Morvik said this first, that there were uh, 10 to the 11th neurons per brain. There are about uh, 1,000 synapses uh, at about 100 hertz, giving, gives you uh, about 10 to the 16th operations per second uh, for the whole brain. And uh, Morvik said uh, in his book called Mind Children, which I read back in the yeah. 70s, uh, that um, if you achieve 10 to the 16th operations per second, then you have brain equivalents and you do everything the brain could do. And that would be include consciousness. And then Kurtz, Kurzweil latched onto this as the singularity. And when we reach that point, uh, you know, we'll have brain equivalents and, and uh, everything will be, we can have consciousness. And uh, I, I didn't think that was true. And because I thought you had to go to the uh, a deeper level of the microtubules and the microtubules, there's about, 10 to the eighth to 10 to the ninth tubulins per neuron and uh, oscillating at say 10 megahertz. And that gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron if you go to the microtubule level. Um, and so I was going around to AI meetings and neural net meetings uh, being kind of a nuisance to people like you and AI people saying, uh, uh, 
No, you have to go deeper. You know, it's not just yeah. the 16th, it's not just, you have to go to a deeper level and you have all this information uh, going on. And then one day somebody said to me, okay, wise guy, Mr. Wise ass, giving us a hard time. Let's say you're right. Uh, how would that explain consciousness? How would that explain feelings, love, joy, emotion? This was the hard problem being thrown in my face. Yeah. Uh, 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 quite a, five, five years or so before uh, Chalmers introduced the concept at the 1994 conference, as you mentioned. Um, but it was the same idea. How do you explain qualia? How does information processing uh, produce feelings, love, joy, emotions, uh, envy, uh, everything? And I had to admit that I didn't know. I was stumped. And uh, worse, I thought I'd become a reductionist, an ultra reductionist, which I was kind of against on general principles. But uh, I really didn't have a good answer. And uh, but fortunately, that same person and unfortunately, I don't remember who it was. I would I'm very grateful to him. I remember it was a, a, a guy. Uh, he said I should I recommended this book by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind. And uh, I sort of knew the name Roger Penrose. I recognized it. So I went and bought the book, The Emperor's New Mind. And I read it and I was uh, really blown away by its breadth and depth in so many different areas. But the main point was that uh, consciousness was not a computation. Consciousness was yeah. not computable. And it was a little dig at AI. I think the emperor, the emperor was probably mm. Minsky. And uh, the idea was that uh, he really didn't have any, any uh, idea or good idea of how to approach consciousness. And I think that was true. And I think it's, it's still true, unfortunately. But if not computation, what was it? And uh, the first part of the book was about Gödel's theorem and how a mathematical proof must be, a, ma a mathematical theorem must be uh, proven by a conscious mathematician to know that it's, it's correct. And Roger kind of extrapolated that to say that understanding of any kind, knowing something and knowing is a feeling uh, required something outside of computation, something non-computable which meant, uh, I realized later, something outside of classical physics. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and that doesn't leave much except for quantum physics. Yeah. And maybe general relativity. But quantum, you know, and the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And so he talked, uh, talked about the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, and I had heard about it, but didn't really know much about it. I'd kind of avoided quantum physics. Um, but I got, but not entirely because I had followed Froelich and I'll come back to Froelich, but um, Rogers suggested that what consciousness needed or what was required for consciousness was also the solution to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, kind of uh, feeding two birds with one hand, you might say. And uh, uh, the measurement problem is, as you may know, has to do with the fact that in the quantum world uh, at, at small scales, at least, and we don't know how small, that's the problem. Particles can be in multiple states or locations at the same time. A particle can be here and here at the same time, the same particle. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and yet when you ob observe or measure that, it, you only see one, you see it here or here, not in both places. And early quantum uh, pioneers, Niels Bohr and others back at the turn of the 20th century, um, recognized that there were superpositions, but when they made a measurement on them uh, or when somebody consciously observed them, they collapsed, the wave function collapsed or the quantum state reduced, quantum state reduction, collapse of the wave function to definite states. And Schrodinger, of course, uh, uh, and, and some people, but Neumann, Wigner and others, and more recently, Stapp and Chalmers and his colleague, uh, Kelvin McQueen, have, uh, have f c followed the idea that consciousness causes quantum state reduction, that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. And uh, Schrodinger thought this was such an absurd idea that he came up with this famous thought experiment of amplifying a quantum superposition, like a, a photon going through a half silver mirror and not going through, into uh, triggering a po poison in a, in a, inside a box that, that had a cat and would kill the cat. And so Schrodinger pointed out that um, according to this interpretation, which came to be known as the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, 
that uh, uh, the cat would be both dead and alive yeah. until somebody opened the box and took a look. And this was so patently absurd that he thought this would uh, eliminate the idea that consciousness caused collapse. But unfortunately, it didn't because there weren't any other, there weren't any better suggestions. Yeah. And uh, later, people used decoherence that a quantum system uh, meeting a classical system will kind of mix and you kind of lose the quantum system or multiple worlds where every possibility in a superposition uh, uh, goes off and forms its own universe. And uh, that's very popular now. Um, but none of those are really very satisfying. Uh, the idea that, that the conscious observer didn't explain what consciousness was, nor how it could affect the superposition, nor did it explain what a superposition was. And uh, multiple worlds had a lot of baggage, still has a lot of baggage, uh, you might say, uh, the need for an infinite number of, of worlds. And, uh, but uh, uh, there weren't any better ideas for either consciousness or collapse of the wave function. And then in this book, Roger came up with a solution to both. And um, the idea to do so, he started off by first uh, defining what a superposition was. How could something be here and here at the same time? And to do that, he relied on uh, general relativity, Einstein's theory of general relativity, in which uh, a particle is equivalent to curvature in space-time yeah. geometry. And Einstein came up with this for large objects like the sun. And so he predicted that, that a star behind the sun uh, could be visible in an eclipse if you blotted out the sun because the, the sun would curve the, the light from the star and you could, you could see it. And then Eddington in 1919 went to a mountaintop in, in an eclipse and, and confirmed that the stars known to be behind the sun were visible uh, yeah. because they were being... Uh, the space time was curved. And so, uh, of course, we didn't know and still don't know for sure what space time actually is. Space time, yeah. actually, although Roger Penrose is probably the world's expert in that. Um, and what he did uh, to solve the measurement problem was to say, okay, curvature works for big objects, but what about small objects? What about a quantum particle, uh, an electron or a proton or something like that? And he said, well, it's going to have its own tiny curvature and a superposition of it being here and here would be a curvature of this direction and a curvature of this direction. And you have a separation in the fundamental level of the universe. Yeah. And you could imagine that if these the separation were to continue, if each curvature branched off and formed its own universe, you'd have the multiple worlds hypothesis. Yeah. I think that the many worlds people really should adopt uh, Roger's uh, idea of, of uh, curvature separation, which would make, in my opinion, uh, multiple worlds more, more tenable, more feasible. Um, but Roger said that these, curvature, these separated curvatures were unstable. So after a time, T would collapse to one or the other. And uh, uh, when that happens, and here was the real kicker, when that happens, when that collapse occurs by a specific formula equals h bar over t, which I can unpack a little bit later, um, this reduction would occur and it would generate a moment of conscious experience. And there would be a little now moment or bing, as I sometimes use them. Yeah. Box. And uh, that this self collapse of the wave function was the source of conscious experience in the universe. And, uh, this was certainly a mind-blowing thing for me back then. Uh, and uh, a lot of people criticized it because uh, of Chalmers himself uh, criticized the idea for invoking what he called the mythical law of minimization of mysteries. If you have one oh. mystery <laughs> yeah. and two mysteries, uh, you know, one solves the other. And, uh, you know, he meant that as a dig, but I think it's actually true in this case or could be. I mean, he himself and others are now saying, well, consciousness causes collapse. And Roger had turned that around and said, no, collapse occurs spontaneously and causes consciousness. Yeah. And uh, it was, and I think it remains the only uh, scientific proposal for the source of conscious experience in the universe, other than what I consider hand-waving arguments about complexity or... Uh, yeah, and there, there is no shortage to it of those... Uh hand waving arguments. What I find, Stuart, most fascinating uh, 
as a student of physics, math, uh, even neuroscience as of late, uh, in your and Roger's journey, that it, it makes a lot of sense to me as a student in the following sense. So without uh, consciousness or an observer, what is the meaning of it all for a, a universe that has no, you know, no consciousness function? <laughs> uh, so it looks like a very meaningless kind of universe. And then to your point, uh, in our current understanding, quantum mechanics and general relativity, they are two very fundamental theories of nature. While they may be incomplete, that is what our current understanding is. They have huge predictive power. They have withstood the test of time. Uh, quantum mechanics definitely is the way forward. Forget about a different, a, a given implementation or an interpretation. So then hence, you know, and then when you also look at nature, uh, there are many other examples of spontaneity, you know, symmetry breakdowns at a spontaneous lab in, in a spontaneous fashion. So, so it all makes, it all makes sense that some of that gives rise to what you call being, I love that, I love that term. Uh, but maybe, you know, uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, why there is this link between this uh, causal link between the, the spontaneous sort of collapse and the being. So how we think that that is the atom of consciousness, that is the, the proto unit. Uh, so certainly, you know, then you have to take a look at uh, experimental uh, evidence and that sort of thing. So if maybe you want to comment a little bit upon that. And I also love the fact that we go inside the neuron because almost everybody else is looking at, uh, to your point, uh, wiring diagrams or complexity and uh, kind of insulting neuron to say it is just an on off switch. And when you look at it, it, it looks a lot more sophisticated than an on off switch. So I'll, I think let's continue going on this journey of inside in a neuron and uh, microtubules, what are they? And how does this spontaneous sort of collapse mechanistically, the mechanism of it happening? Well, uh, two, two separate questions there. So uh, I'll, I'll take them one at a time. As far as the microtubules and the cytoskeletal proteins inside neurons, uh, as I said, I spent uh, 20 years working on the idea that they process information before I got to yeah. realize that it was in kind of a, a, a blind alley and uh, I needed something different. That's when I uh, read Roger's book. Um, but um, there are a number of reasons to think that we definitely need to go inside the neuron uh, for consciousness and for even for cognition. I mentioned sing single cell organisms like paramecium, which yeah. do things. I'm not saying it's conscious. Uh, an amoeba, as I said, can solve the traveling salesman problem with its microtubules and the paramecium uses its microtubules too. In neither case are they necessarily conscious, although I think they could be at a given time, maybe slower than ours. Um, and so, uh, you know, why would a neuron be a simple on off switch and only use its membranes when these other uh, cells were using their microtubules for cognition? So, um, and also we don't have a, we still don't have a good site for memory in the brain. Yeah. People say, well, synaptic plasticity, uh, you know, the uh, strength of synapses, but uh, the synaptic proteins that mediate synaptic plasticity, the strength of each synapse only lasts hours to days and yet memories can last lifetimes. And we think, excuse me, that the uh, memory is encoded in microtubules and we have some ideas about that with the, for example, the enzyme CAMK2, which uh, in long-term potentiation is activated and can, we showed how it can uh, encode up to six bits of information per CAMK2. And you have thousands of these per synaptic event. Uh, so in the, the microtubule lattice, each tubulin can have, uh, I think 22 different in the brain, 22 different isozymes. 
and a number of post-translational modifications, phosphorylation, a binding of various things. So um, each tubulin can have maybe 30 different states. And you have uh, uh, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the ninth tubulins per neuron. So in terms of memory, you know, 10 to the 30th times 10, yeah. to the, it's a lot of memory per neuron, which allows you to have distributed memory so that you can repeat uh, and have something like a hologram over the whole brain. Uh, so, and I think that's what's going on actually. It's something holographic that Pre as Prebram suggested back in the seventies. Uh, but uh, when Prebram proposed it, people, critics said, well, you need a, a laser for a hologram and there's no laser in the brain. Well, I think the microtubules are exactly that, acting something like a laser and uh, to give you a coherent source of energy, which interferes to give you a hologram. But you need uh, the microtubules for cognition, you need them for, um, for memory and uh, um, maybe to generate a hologram too. But let me go to another point about, uh, about what you said about the universe and the purpose and so forth. I, I'm jumping ahead here because um, what's, the, what's the purpose of life really? And you know, most people assume that you know, life, life occurred, life developed, and then at some point the brain got sufficiently complicated or something that consciousness occurred. But if, you know, a, a lot of neuroscientists resort to panpsychism. And if that's the case, um, uh, consciousness was there all along. Yeah. This preceded, uh, it, if panpsychism is true, when, when, whenever life started, uh, the primordial soup uh, on earth uh, or somewhere else some, uh, at some other time in the universe, uh, it was there before life. And uh, I've come to the opinion that uh, life actually developed uh, because of consciousness and that feelings, for example, continue to drive our behavior. And we know that in experimental laboratory animals, it's all about reward and, and punishment, you know, to, uh, to control behavior. And I think that holds true for, uh, uh, for uh, evolution, our, our own evolution, living systems. And I have a paper, for example, about how, uh, Object Roger, Roger's theory, uh, which we haven't unpacked too much yet, um, occurred in the primordial soup and prompted the origin of life, prompted uh, my cells and simple uh, biomolecules uh, to self-organize, to optimize feelings, fe fe good feelings, pleasure, let's say, was the feedback fitness function for uh, self-organization and, and evolution. And uh, that's something that I'm working on now in a, in a slightly different context. But I think uh, consciousness uh, uh, or, it's pre or something like proto-consciousness perhaps preceded life and prompted its origin. And then uh, uh, life enabled more and more uh, intricate consciousness to occur. So uh, I think sometimes we get the, the cart before the horse and think that consciousness emerged from living systems when I, when I think it's the other way around. I am with you. I am of the same mindset that, uh, and this is not for... Uh, my ethnic background and those reasons, uh, but uh, purely just, you know, as a student of science, I also feel that uh, consciousness comes first. So in this sometimes even a more immediate debate of cognition versus consciousness, I can see consciousness happening a lot before cognition or totally independent of cognition, or even when we lose cognition, we are still conscious contents of consciousness might become limited or whatever, and different conscious entities uh, may might have different, you know, uh, uh, types of contents, sophistication of those contents, but consciousness itself, that state of consciousness, uh, I think is a lot more fundamental, original and whatnot. So before uh, Stuart, we go into and take a deeper dive into Roger's theory, uh, so I'm an engineer, so you know we talk about stories and case studies and use cases. So I have a, this is in fact a question that came from uh, somebody in the, in the tech industry and they are thinking about consciousness engineering. So their question for you is uh, that, and I'm gonna read and paraphrase as best as I can, that uh, 
we are conscious beings, you know, it's a subjective experience, you know, we all uh, at least are aware of our own consciousness. And in that conscious existence, pain is a very original thing, you know, so out of all the things, the, the, the redness of the red and this and that and whatever, according to this person, and I believe that too, pain is original, it feels your own when you, when you, when you experience that. So then the question goes on that, okay, when you look at it from, you know, a base neuroscience perspective, it looks like there is this nociception phenomenon. So there are some sensors, you know, in the skin. So you have some transduction going on, uh, then it transmits to, uh, so we are different neuronal mechanisms to uh, spinal cord, and then it goes all the way to, to brain to those uh, clamocortical sort of connections and it gets perceived, but only when it gets perceived, it feels that, okay, we are having the feeling or perception of pain. And if the transduction and transmission is somehow uh, interrupted, uh, then suddenly there is nothing for uh, those right places in brain to perceive. Uh, Perception is important in this question. And there is a question, I'll get to that too. Uh, because uh, people can perceive pain without uh, any stimulus, you know, the phantom limbs and those types of things, uh, because somatosensory cortex have memory of those things. Uh, so you can feel uh, uh, pain without any stimulus. So nociception doesn't mean necessarily pain, even though in certain cases they can be correlated. So then this question sort of goes on and there is an actually, and at the end of the day, there's a question to it too. That, okay, so when you look in the brain, uh, you can see, you know, different parts of the brain involved in the perception. Anesthesia and anesthesiology is probably our best chance at understanding how that perception mechanism, even in the presence of stimulus, gets disturbed. The textbook view is when anesthesia happens, some kind of GABA receptors, uh, they get you know, affected. Uh, and even though anesthesia, general anesthesia is a highly active and dynamical brain state. There's a lot of activity going on in the brain, very distinct from sleep, uh, but no longer a perception of pain, uh, which is the most conscious thing that we as subjective beings experience. So question now for Stuart is, in your lifetime of studying anesthesia and a practitioner in that field and, you know, quantum mechanics and uh, everything and inside neurons. And suddenly you have point of views on the textbook view. What happens, you know, in general anesthesia, which order gets disturbed so that we no longer perceive pain and, you know, thank God. And then people who need surgeries, you know, they, uh, they can do that and all that. Right. Well, first of all, uh, there's a difference between chronic pain and acute pain. Uh, and uh, anesthesiologists take care of uh, acute pain in the operating room. We, we anesthetize our patients. And we take away not only their perception of pain, but their perception of everything. They have no, no awareness and no consciousness at all. It's, uh, it's uh, idling or gone or depending on how you want to put it. No memories either. So you don't form no memories any memories. Form during anesthesia. Now, there are occasional tragic cases of patients waking up that uh, I may have mentioned. But, you know, we, we, we do our best to avoid that. And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we just have to watch our patients carefully. Unfortunately, there's no monitor that tells us when patients get a, get could become. So we have to rely on clinical science and so forth. But chronic pain if, is different. Chronic pain, as you said, like phantom pain, but also just any chronic pain, it can continue if there's no ongoing nociceptive input. It's just a learned behavior. It's And then if you 
take opiates, you know, it, uh, it helps for a while, but then you need more and more and it just kind of imprints the pain even worse. So I actually used to do chronic pain and, uh, you know, I got out of it when the opiate opiate epidemic was just kind of getting going and I could see where this was going. And, uh, but now, you know, we use nerve blocks, we use ver uh, various uh, techniques for chronic pain. Um, but it's separate from, from anesthesia, yeah. uh, where, uh, we take away everything. So if you need your belly opened or your head opened or anything opened, it, it's going to hurt. So we, we render you unconscious and the mechanism of anesthesia in taking away consciousness while the brain, as you said, uh, continues to be active. Uh, the EEG continues, evoke potentials continue. EEG is slowed. Everything slows down, but it's still there. And uh, you lose the high frequency stuff generally. Um, and uh, evoke potentials continue. In fact, we, during spine cases, for example, we, we, the electrophysiologists come in and they may stimulate the finger or the foot and record from the brain to make sure the spinal cord is intact where the surgeons are working. And, um, and so we follow these evoked potentials while the patient is unconscious under anesthesia. So the brain is active, there are evoked potentials, but there's no conscious awareness. And uh, the reason for, for that is, well, it's, it's the mystery of anesthesia, but basically inputs into, uh, from the spinal cord and, and most cranial nerves go through uh, thalamus and then to primary cortex. So for vision to be V1 in the back of the brain and then feed forward to the front of the brain uh, and then from the front of the brain, the third wave broadcasts, and that's what, what is consciousness, this third wave, or seems to correlate with consciousness. That activity correlates with consciousness. The problem is that that happens three to 500 milliseconds after sensory input, and yet we often respond within 100 milliseconds. Now, because of that, because we respond before this activity that seems to correlate with consciousness occurs, most neuroscientists and philosophers, if pressed, would have to say that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, and we have this false illusion that consciousness occurs, uh, that consciousness was in control. It actually occurs after the fact we have a false illusion that it was there when we acted. And the only way around that is through quantum physics and, and backward time effects, which is uh, what Roger and I have, have, have said. Um, but getting back to, so, and it's only the third wave that is inhibited by anesthesia. So what do anesthetics do? So um, there are a number of types of anesthetics. The, the most interesting are the gases. Uh, and these were discovered in the 19th uh, uh, century. Uh, people uh, uh, were breathed small amounts of things like ether and nitrous oxide and got giddy and high, euphoric. And they had ether frolics and laughing gas and so forth. But then it was realized that if they breathe more, they become unconscious. And, uh, and there was a zone where they would keep breathing and, and, uh, and, and, still, be, uh, and still be unconscious. And that could be utilized for anesthesia and, and surgery. And that's exactly what happened uh, at the ether dome and at the Mass General Hospital. It actually happened in Georgia uh, ten, a few years before, but... Uh, that guy didn't write, didn't publish, and so he kind of got bypassed. But uh, the gases uh, act by uh, very weak quantum forces, Van der Waals forces. Uh, they're very insoluble in water. They're very lipid soluble. So you breathe them, they go into the lungs, into the blood. They're insoluble in blood, so they transit quickly and leave and look for nonpolar fat-like medium. And they go into fat stores, and they go into membranes, lipid membranes. And they go inside proteins in the in internal core of proteins. There's uh, non these aromatic amino acids that are fat-like, and that's where anesthetics bind. And so um, uh, Meyer and Overton at the turn of the 20th century found a, a linear correlation over many orders of magnitude between the potency of an anesthetic and its solubility in olive oil, which is yeah. uh, 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 like aromatic rings, including uh, or organic rings, uh, including the aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. But most people at that time thought, well, they must work in a lipid part of the membrane. That turned out not to be the, the case. Uh, and then it was a question of uh, which protein, and everybody thought, well, membrane proteins, uh, ion channels, receptors for GABA, which you mentioned, the acetylcholine, uh, serotonin, and glycine were the the big four in terms of where anesthetics bind and they do bind to all of those GABA in particular. But 
that's not to say that anesthetics act by GABA receptors, which are mm -hmm. inhibitory. So they would have to potentiate their activity, which they do. But the problem is that not all anesthetics bind to GABA receptors and some anesthetics cause them to open and some cause them to close. Yeah. So there was no consistent uh, mechanism for GABA uh, or any membrane receptor. And in fact, in 2008, the leading, uh, the leading lights in anesthetic mechanism research led by a, a guy named Ted Eager at UCSF, who was uh, clearly the, 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 the leader and uh, uh, looking at membrane proteins. And he finally, and he and a bunch of prom very prominent people said, you know, we've looked at this for 20 years and it just doesn't work. There's no membrane receptor. There's no combination of membrane receptors that can account for anesthetic action. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, we need a new paradigm. Well, unfortunately, the new paradigm that he proposed was going back to uh, lipid, lipid theories, which, which don't work for other reasons. Uh, any change in a lipid bilayer you can, is, is less, caused by anesthesia is less than what would be caused by a slight change in temperature. So, you know, you get a slight fever or get a little cold, you don't lose consciousness. So that doesn't really work. So um, in the, around 2006, uh, a group at Penn led by a very prominent uh, anesthetic researcher named Rod Eckenhoff started to do systematic uh, look at uh, which proteins were bound by anesthetics. And he found 70 different proteins, about half in the membrane, half in the cytoplasm, including tubulin, microtubules. And then he did genomics and, and proteomics and optogenetics work to figure out which protein specifically was affected. And the evidence pointed to microtubules and tubulin. And he also showed that, that patients on this drug Taxol, which is an anti-cancer drug, which stabilizes microtubules, and it turned, uh, actually they required more anesthesia. And it looks like Taxol actually blocks access of the anesthetic to, to its binding site on tubulin, on microtubules. So um, this all suggested that maybe it was happening in microtubules and the binding of the anesthetic to tubulin was about a thousand times weaker than it was to GABA. So if you had the same number of GABA receptors, you'd have way more anesthetic than GABA receptors. But there's about a million times more tubulins per neuron than GABA receptors. And the tubulins act collectively, and, um, or it appears that way. And uh, my colleague, Travis Craddock, and Jack Jasinski, and I, and others, uh, in 2017, published in Scientific Reports a paper, a computer modeling paper, looking at the, all these aromatic rings in tubulin where the anesthetics would bind. And if you just... Uh, calculated at KT at ambient temperature or physiological temperature, they would oscillate uh, the, these pi resonance rings when they get close, they induce dipoles and then they oscillate in terahertz, which is a visible light actually. Yeah. And, uh, um, we showed this paper that uh, if you uh, modeled the oscillations of these uh, 86 pi resonance rings in, in tubulin, you got a spectrum in the terahertz very pretty complicated uh, spectrum, but with a common mode peak at about 613 terahertz. And when you model the placement of the anesthetic, which which forms its own van der Waals force and disperses these dipole oscillations, that uh, the, the peak went away and proportional to potency. So we got a Meyer Overton correlation for anesthetic uh, dampening of terahertz oscillations in tubulin. And uh, I think uh, it's one of the one of the few correlations, Meyer Overton type correlations. So, uh, and this these oscillations would be consistent with the Orca or theory because it would cause enough superposition to to get the quantum gravity effect. So, uh, despite the uh, despite what the textbooks say um, uh, that you know it's GABA, it's not GABA because it can't be GABA exclusively because um, not all anesthetics bind to GABA. And, but people uh, stick to their guns and say, well, uh, then anesthetics must act differently. Each anesthetic acts differently. But that makes no sense in, in the light of the meyer overton correlation. Why do you get this beautiful linear correlation over many orders yeah. of magnitude? So I think the only thing that makes sense, even though it, you know, and I'm biased, obviously, but I think the data and, and is that anesthetics act on by dampening um, terahertz oscillations in tubulin in microtubules and it, it kind of, you know, so, okay. So critics would say, uh, well, anesthetics bind all over the body. They bind by uh, these quantum forces to everything. 
why don't they affect anything else? And the answer is, I think that only consciousness has highly organized quantum processes. So if you have a random quantum effect uh, dampening a ra another random quantum effect, who cares? It's not going to make any difference. But if you have a random quantum effect uh, altering a highly orchestrated, highly organized quantum mechanism, like in a microtubule where you have billions and trillions of these things oscillating coherently, then you can have a significant effect with a small amount. So that's what I think is going on with anesthesia. No, I think that's 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 very sort of you know spot on. Let's just I think follow on from here uh, on a few other sort of uh, adjacent areas. For example, Stuart, that uh, why is only certain parts of the brain conscious? Uh, you know, you often talk about that. Hey, uh, sort of you know the input from uh, uh, thalamus comes to uh, layer four of neocortex and from there it goes to layer one, two, three. Uh, I mean, uh, and then from there, you know, to six and then it converges on five and those three waves. Uh, so it, I think would be good to talk about what is this organization that happens where all these bings somehow they add up uh, and then we have this conscious experience how come cerebellum apparently have no effect on consciousness? We can take it out apparently and, and no loss of consciousness. Why are some other parts of the body not conscious? You know, here's this other question. It looks like that in our tummy, there are all kind of, you know, uh, neurons, uh, the enteric nervous system and whatnot. Uh, how come no consciousness there, or maybe we are not just Maybe there, maybe there is consciousness there and this consciousness is not aware of that. Uh, so I think there are all these questions on that why the bing happens, you know, uh, in certain parts of the brain, but not in other parts of the brain or in the body. Uh, and it, what are your sort of uh, thoughts on that? You started, you started with uh, uh, the, the cortex and the inputs going to uh, one, two, three, or go to four and then one, two, three, and six, and then converging on five, layer five. Uh, and they contain the giant pyramidal cells. And I think this is very important. So uh, it, layer five has these giant, the biggest cells uh, maybe in the body, certainly neurons, they're, they're pyramid shaped or conical yeah. shaped. And uh, their apical dendrite goes to the brain surface and gives rise to EEG. Uh, they're, uh, axons descend directly to the spinal cord for the extra param the pyramidal tracts to move things. And uh, their, their basilar uh, dendrites go out and contact other basilar dendrites. So uh, you have this network of pyramidal cells connected by basilar dendrites that's kind of a monolayer sheet covering the entire cortex. Now, one thing that's very interesting about uh, uh, neurons is that... Uh, in all other cells in, in biology, the microtubules are arranged kind of like spokes of, of a wheel, uh, where they start in the, near the cells, uh, near the nucleus, but actually the, the centrosome, which are centrioles, which a particular arrangement, and they, they're unipolar, so they have their, their plus end out, and their minus end in, or is it the other way around? I can't, I think that's right. But they're all in the same polarity pointing in the same direction, like spokes of a wheel. And they're, they're continuous. They're part of the cytoskeleton. So you wouldn't want to break them apart. You wouldn't want to break your bones to get structural support. However, in, uh, and in axons, they're like that too. They go continuously uh, in unipolar. In dendrites and cell bodies or soma, the microtubules are interrupted. They're broken and they're, they're short and they're in mixed polarity. So you have one going up, and next to one going down and the same. So they're in these mixed polarity networks of interrupted. And what that does is that Roger and I put this in a 2014 paper when they, when they oscillate say in terahertz, but this one and this one are gonna be slightly different oscillation frequencies because they're, they're both in the same net voltage from the membrane. And so they're gonna oscillate, they're gonna have slightly different oscillation frequency, which gives rise to beat frequencies. Just like in a guitar or a musical instrument, if, if something slightly out of tune, you get a beat, you get a much slower beat, the difference between 
between the two frequencies. And we think these B frequencies actually uh, interfere from terahertz to gigahertz to megahertz to kilohertz and then hertz. And actually EEG is a product of interference beats among microtubules, much faster uh, oscillations in microtubules. So you need, uh, and so in, in these pyramidal cell bodies, you have these huge arrays of mixed polarity uh, uh, microtubules that are connected across this whole layer throughout the entire cortex. So, uh, and that temporally synchronizes the, the, the orco R so that uh, they all uh, reach threshold since they're entangled, mm -hmm. presumably, each th reach threshold simultaneously and you have bing uh, of a, a huge amount of, uh, of turbulence. And we actually can calculate that. And uh, so there's about 20, to the, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 20th power turbulence in the brain, 10 to the 19th, 10 to the 20th, something like that. And um, for uh, megahertz, if you put in say 10 megahertz, so the formula is E sub G equals H bar over T. The one, well, the one formula I'll mention. E sub G is the gravitational self energy, the amount of energy to separate something from itself, going back to Roger's uh, original idea. And H bar is Planck's constant over two pi and T is the time at which this will occur. So if you have a very a small E sub G, T is going to be very long. So going back to the paramecium, it might have a, a conscious moment uh, once once a minute, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and whereas we have the conscious moments at, at 10 megahertz, 10 to the 10 to the seventh times a second. Uh, and so we have much greater E sub G, much greater intensity, much greater potential capacity uh, uh, diversity for example. And that happens in cortex. So uh, it can happen in microtubules in general. Uh, you mentioned uh, the gut. The heart has a lot of uh, microtubules. Uh, the cerebellum has a lot of microtubules, but it doesn't have any pyramidal cells. Neither do the others. So uh, IIT, the theory of Tononi and Koch, they make a big deal about the cerebellum not being conscious because of complexity, but I think it's not conscious because it doesn't have any uh, pyramidal cells, pyramidal but cells. it doesn't have these, these mixed polarity uh, networks. So I think the, uh, I think the consciousness is probably most focused or uh, comes from layer, the, this blanket of layer five pyramidal cells over the entire cortex. And it has direct uh, access to movement to, uh, spinal cord and connects to these lateral uh, uh, basilar dendrites and also generates EEG. So uh, I think uh, I think that answers most of your questions. Uh, there are microtubules everywhere. Uh, some people say, well, you know, there's microtubules in my rear end is my rear end conscious. And I say, well, maybe over a long period of time, but not, as, not nearly so much as, you know, in the pyramidal cells. Yeah. In your brain. No, that is uh, a very sort of, interesting, insightful uh, answer, especially around the pyramidal cells and also the fact that uh, if consciousness is a time series and, you know, you're having, you know, these frequent experiences and then maybe there are other structures where they are having this conscious moment every once in a while or once in a blue moon or a lot more slowly. So I can, I can, I can, I can see that. Uh, now I would imagine, uh, uh, Stuart, that then if pyramidal cells play such a fundamental role to our conscious experience, then uh, these uh, general anesthesia uh, sort of, you know, procedures or uh, gases or uh, chemical substances that they impact the activity of those pyramidal cells, I would just kind of naturally think that there's a correlation between, between the two. Right. And uh, well, it would be the microtubules in the pyramidal cells. And uh, right. we're actually attempting to study that. We got a grant from the Templeton Foundation and we're looking for quantum effects in microtubules and then effects of anesthesia upon them. And uh, this is being done at the Princeton lab of Greg Scholes, who's a very prominent quantum biologist, supervised by my colleague, Jack Tusinski, and his uh, graduate student, who's now a postdoc at, uh, 
at Princeton under uh, Sc Greg Scholes, Arat Kalra, who's doing the experiments. And uh, we have the other members of the team are Aristide Dogariu uh, from Central Florida, who's looking at uh, delayed luminescence in microtubules, a different quantum effect. Uh, Bruce McIver, uh, uh, an anesthetic mechanism researcher who favors GABA. He's not quite in our camp, but he's objective and we'll do the experiments. And Travis Craddock has done the modeling. So um, we're looking at, we found, we found very interesting quantum effects, uh, fluorescence resonance transfer that lasts at least uh, five nanoseconds in a microtubule, which is very long compared to um, what was shown in photosynthesis, which is the previous world record in picoseconds and extending over uh, uh, five or six uh, tubulin dimers. So like 30 or 40 nanometers. Uh, we, uh, the anesthetic, we haven't tried the anesthetics yet because these microtubules uh, require taxol to stabilize them and taxol blocks the anesthetics. So we're going to, we have to uh, finagle a little bit to try, try without taxol and we're working on that. But we have shown already that, you know, the, the big challenge when we first started this was, was uh, quantum effects require uh, absolute cold uh, in the laboratory, um, but the brain is is very warm and therefore it couldn't possibly survive uh, long enough. But we've shown uh, we've shown that that they can. They can last long enough for you know what we need. Uh, the minimum being uh, 10 megahertz, but uh, perhaps longer. And we've shown we've shown longer. So uh, we'll keep going. We want to look at effects of anesthetics and also uh, psychoactive drugs, psychedelics, for example. I would I would. Uh, hypothesize that they would increase the the quantum coherence, the fr the frequency, whereas the anesthetic would reduce them. Good stuff. Good stuff. This next question uh, is along the lines of uh, uh, how much Stuart thinks the action of consciousness is within the neuron or other cell bodies versus the wiring of the brain and the synaptic connections and whatnot. Uh, perhaps they both have needed, in Stuart's opinion, what role they both play, the, the magic that happened inside the neuron, and uh, then all these synaptic neuronal connections, and your uh, view on that. And I think there is this side question in that one, too, that how come uh, at a given point in time, we are perceiving uh, apparently a lot more compared to what uh, we are conscious of. So it looks like there's a limitation to what we can conscious of at a given point. And there is some complete mechanism uh, for a lack of better term going on and Stuart's you know, thoughts on uh, competition. So two part question, uh, neuron versus connections, and then uh, uh, what is this compete mechanism in your opinion where uh, we are uh, perceiving more stuff, but we are only conscious of a limited set of it. And if we change circumstances, the stuff that we were not conscious of, uh, we that we are perceiving, we can become conscious of and that sort of thing, telling that more perception is going on, but less consciousness, which means, you know, uh, there is some kind of selection, competitive competition mechanism going on. All right. Well, let's see. The first question, uh, I think consciousness is happening in the dendrites and soma where you have the mixed, uh, mixed polarity uh, microtubules. And uh, so you have this uh, E sub G when it reaches a threshold, there's a collapse and it requires many, many tubulins and many, many neurons, pyramidal cells primarily. And then there's a collective conscious moment. And if you're talking, we're talking about volitional action, then there's an action. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this, the activity that seems correlated with this conscious perception happens three to, three to 500 milliseconds after sensory impingement. And yet we respond within hundred milliseconds, causing most people to say, well, consciousness is epiphenomenal. Uh, the, the problem with that is we don't see the act, the or activity, the unconscious act, uh, activity. But um, Ben Libet in 1979 showed that there's this apparent backward time referral going on in the brain in sensory. And he, I won't explain his experiments 
now, but he, he showed that you need three to 500 milliseconds of activity uh, to refer the, the, uh, the sensation and therefore the action back to where the evoked potential was. So you need both in this evoked potential, which happens almost immediately, and then ongoing activity. But if the ongoing activity is shut off, even if you have the evoked potential, you don't get consciousness. So the brain somehow knows at the time of the evoked potential whether or not there will be this ongoing activity. So this requires some kind of backward time effects. And Roger has Roger first wrote about this in The Emperor's New Mind. And, and uh, I got to introduce him and, uh, him and Libet at the 1994 uh, conference. And uh, uh, he has uh, postulated that there is a backward, that every collapse, every OR, orc OR moment, there's a, a referral of quantum information backwards in time. And in fact, uh, in his recent work, he says that's necessary uh, to get rid of the, uh, the, the possibility that wasn't chosen. And this, this has to do with the mechanism of, of collapse and objective reduction, uh, because the, uh, uh, if you if you have if you have this uh, this un unused uh, curvature uh, and you get rid of it, it should cause generate heat. And there's no heat. People measured this, and and it was a criticism of his objective reduction. But if if there's this backward time effect, the curvature that wasn't used was never there, and the first or for all practical purposes wasn't there. You know, there's no heat. So anyway, you need this backward time effect, and that could explain how we have well, uh, potentially free will, how we can act in real time. If you say something and I respond quickly, it's not because, uh, it's, be it's because your activity might take three to 500 milliseconds for my brain to figure out, but then it's referred backwards in time. So I can, I can answer you um, more immediately. And, this, and you're doing the same thing with me and, and people, that's, yeah. that's how it goes. When we, when we even talk. Yes, talk, talk or, or hit a baseball or hit a tennis ball. Uh, it requires it apparently requires this, this backward time effect and it, it gets out of the the uh, the problem that neuroscience has to say if you just believe in classical physics and neurons that, uh, that consciousness is epiphenomenal we're just all, we're just merely helpless we're helpless spectators along for the ride as uh, Huxley said uh, but yet with backward time we can get around this and I have a paper on that that's it's actually my most read paper uh, how quantum brain biology can rescue conscious free will. And uh, you know, we, we uh, Roger and I have talked about it in our papers and he's written a, a recent paper about the physics of the backward time effects, which he thinks is necessary for entanglement in general. Even EPR, if you make a measurement here and something happens over here, it's because when you make it here, it goes backward in time to when they were together and then forward in time. So this backward time effect is probably a very common and necessary thing. So this next question is related to that. It also, you know, I'm just combining some of these questions to it as well. So two parts now. One is for what are your and Roger's plans in the years ahead in terms of taking your research into a certain direction? Uh, and then second is uh, for uh, people who are active in this field, researchers, uh, it looks like in order for a research group to be successful with consciousness, you have to take an interdisciplinary approach. They are citing this example that Roger, a mathematician or a mathematical physicist, uh, uh, and certainly Roger is a lot more than that, and you and an anesthesiologist, you guys, you know, universe put you together and you came up with all these great ideas uh, and so then this group thinks that, hey, maybe if a team of collaborators are interdisciplinary, they come from different disciplines, that they can be more successful. So, and in your, the question then is, uh, what kind of disciplines you believe uh, people should come from uh, for these teams to have a higher chance of success over time? And then the party is, what are Roger and your, you know, individual or together plans for, you know, uh, exploring uh, sort of the next phase of the consciousness research? Uh, well, first of all, uh, 
interdisciplinary true that's exactly why you know we do this interdisciplinary conference uh you know philosophy neuroscience cognitive science uh, mathematics physics biology experiential approaches etc cetera, etc cetera. i think i think that's absolutely necessary consciousness is is so inter truly interdisciplinary as far as which particular ones i don't know i you know uh but physics neuroscience uh philosophy medicine are all are all important um as far as uh Ro i'm gonna see roger next week in finland uh my wife and i are going over there for a, uh, a conference organized by pavo pilkin in helsinki it was going to be a big conference then because of covid they they just limited it and uh when I asked him what you know what he's going to do next, he was going to write a book about M.C. Escher. You know, he's a big fan of uh, the artist. In fact, he worked with him early on. He's going to write a book. I think he's said Escher Maddox. Um, but um, where this is all going, I I think. Uh, well, it, let me also give some advice to engineers uh, and and uh, AI people who might want to build a, a conscious machine. Uh, I think that first of all. Uh, I don't know that much about AI, but I know that one of the great advances recently is is deep learning, where you have put this additional network in a, in a series of artificial networks. And I think, uh, imagine you could put that additional network inside the first network at a deeper, smaller scale, at a deeper level, smaller scale, faster inside. And that's what I think the microtubules are in a neuron. You're going to a deeper level, faster. So the the output of that neuron already has the effects of this deeper level in it rather than having to put another. So I think uh, that's one way to look at it and uh, is that the uh, the microtubules are, a, are like a deep learning network inside uh, neural networks. The second thing is that I think you need quantum computing, but you need it in such a way that it can happen at warm temperature. Uh, well, you wouldn't necessarily if you want to build something, but I think uh, the materials for this will be organic, like graphene and fullerenes. The people are already doing a lot of quantum computing and quantum technology with graphene, uh, which is, you know, you take the basic uh, benzene ring and uh, and put it in a flat sheet, and you get and you get uh, you get graphene. And uh, this has quantum effects. And um, these. Organic rings are found in biology, you know, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Uh, they're apparently present in the primordial soup uh, when life on Earth originated. Uh, recently, I've gotten very interested in uh, the. Uh, 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 there's a University of Arizona professor, Dante Loretta, who is in charge of this mission in which scooped up uh, carbonaceous material from an asteroid that they're bringing back to Earth to look for uh, uh, organic molecules. And they've already found them in meteorites, which crashed to Earth, but they want to rule out any um, contamination. And also, in the, they know it's in the interstellar dust. You have these what are called polyaromatic hydrocarbons of uh, benzene, you know, uh, arrangements of benzene rings, which uh, even in the cold of space should have quantum co cooperativity and collective uh, excitations. And they generate a lot of the terahertz that we see in the cosmic microwave background are coming from these organic molecules. So I think that's going to, um, I think this consciousness is actually, field is going to branch out into uh, what's called astrobiology and uh, maybe even astral consciousness. And uh, in fact, we're gonna have sessions on that at the, at the upcoming uh, Tucson conference uh, in, uh, in April, which uh, will be, right now is hybrid it'll be uh online and hopefully in person if if covid isn't too bad but um in any case uh, uh it'll be online and uh so that's an area that I, so i think quantum computing with materials like graphene and fullerenes uh could give you a quantum computer that could reach uh a threshold for consciousness and uh and and, and something I think it's probably the best bet for uh, engineered consciousness. And uh, it's really copying uh, biology more uh, at the most basic level. No, this is, uh, this is awesome. In fact, there's a question, uh, Stuart, that is very closer to that around these graphene structures. And the question is that, okay, you know, it is clear that we cannot have uh, in our chip design, neuromorphic chip designs, neurons or artificial neurons just to be switches. 
So question for Stuart that what kind of structure he would like to see within such a artificial neuron and uh, using all the neocortex and pyramidal cell analogy, any just high level advice that you can give of, hey, think about putting these kind of structures in the neuron and organize your neurons like this. You alluded to some of that, but if you were to just, you know, give qualitative advice, uh, what would you, sir, say? Well, yeah, graphene, fullerenes, buckyballs, nanotubes, uh, similar structures uh, to these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. They may have uh, some secrets uh, hidden them, hidden within them. Um, to be honest, if you, I'm not sure you need the neuron uh, if you could interface in some way with a, uh, a, a graphene-based uh, system. Mm. Uh, it, it wouldn't be pure. You'd have to dope it or have you know um, program it by having contaminants or or dopants, whatever you want to call it, so that it, it's not all the same. And I think that's possible. Um, so. Uh, uh, and, and I think a lot of this quantum stuff in graphene happens at, at warm temperature. Uh, and so uh, I think that'd be the way to go, actually. Are, there, think, are there research groups that you, that, are, that you are aware of that people can follow or network or collaborate with to advance their research on the engineering research on the design of these new you know, chips that are trying to, uh, you know, attempt to do consciousness engineering. Uh, well, there are a lot of them. I, you know, I it's it's kind of hard to keep up with them. It seems to be exploding. Yeah. And uh, my friend uh, uh, Hartman Nevin, who's head of the Google uh, Quantum AI group, I asked. Uh, I said, Hey, why don't why don't you look at uh, graphene-based quantum computer and uh, he didn't answer, which makes me suspect they, they're already looking at it. I, I could be wrong, but <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are, that's for sure. So it, yeah. just Google it and you'll, you'll find Warm it. temperature, uh, you know, room temperature or, you know, uh, at ambient temperature, quantum computing, that is a, uh, you know, multi-trillion dollar, not even a billion dollar question, a multi-trillion dollar uh, question. No, absolutely. Uh, some people... Uh, Stuart asked the question that, hey, you know, when is your next conference? What is its theme going to be? And then uh, some people followed uh, this special symposium or mini conference that you arranged uh, for Roger. And they want to know, hey, you know, who came? What kind of things got discussed? Did something new out uh, come out from the, Ro the Roger uh, event that you arranged? So, uh, so that... And then maybe, you know, for the upcoming Tucson conference, uh, what are the, the themes or your expectation for your next conference? Well, first about the, the uh, uh, online event we had for Roger, it's all online. It was all recorded. It's four, day, four mornings, uh, 9 to 1230. And uh, if you go to the, uh, our Center for Consciousness Studies website, uh, www.consciousness.arizona.edu, uh, you should be able to find uh, uh, all the uh, all the stuff from uh, that conference. It's it's there, and uh, uh, it was great. Actually, there was a whole lot of new stuff. I, I uh, you know the first day was about black holes. Uh, well, Roger led it off by so uh, we had to pick four major areas of his work: black holes, for which he won the Nobel Prize; objective reduction, collapse of the wave function consciousness and then cyclical conformal cosmology about the fact that the big bang was preceded in his theory the big bang was preceded by another eon and before that another and so we have the serial big bang with, with small letter b you might say uh so that was that was the third the fourth thing so it was great and there was a lot of good good questions and, and so forth uh for the next conference it'll be april 18th through 23rd uh, it'll be held at uh, Ventana Canyon uh, res uh, Resort, where we've had the uh, most recent conferences. Uh, you know, we're hoping people will come live. We're making it hybrid. And uh, we've invited a bunch of speakers, who, uh, almost all of whom have accepted. Uh, although a lot of them are saying they want to uh, 
present online uh, and we said, absolutely, uh, if you change your mind, if everything looks good, you can come. We'd like to have a gathering of people here, but uh, if not, we'll do it online. It's actually a lot easier for us to put, do it online, to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, it'd be nice to have uh, at least a core of people here. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I mentioned one thing that is going to be astrobiology and astro consciousness with uh, Dante Loretta, who's uh, here at the U of A, is in charge of this. Uh, it's called the Osiris Rex mission, and they've already scooped up this material from the asteroid, and it's it's coming back. It'll be here in uh, about two years from now, 2023. Uh, Dante is very interested in the idea that there's not only life out there, and that life on Earth may have started from out there somewhere. Uh, it's called panspermia, this idea. Uh, astrobiology, but also that there's consciousness out there. You know, everybody talks about extraterrestrial intelligence, well, without really defining intelligence, or extraterrestrial life without defining life. And uh, so I think, you know, what we're really looking for, even though people are afraid to say it, uh, is consciousness. So uh, in addition to Avi, we're going to have, uh, 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 sorry, in addition to Dante, we're going to have Avi Loeb, who's a big name, who just wrote the textbook on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or something like that. And Paul Davies, who's written about 30 or 40 books, including uh, some on origin of life and search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And I may speak in that session on, on the idea that uh, consciousness is might be you know out there in these polyaromatic hydrocarbons that are already present in the universe uh we'll see how that goes but uh so that's that's gonna be one one theme uh, and that's kind of something new and different we've never done before uh we're gonna have uh, dave chalmers uh, give a, a a keynote talk on his new book reality plus about virtual reality uh we'll probably have uh, other people i uh maybe roger if we'll do it talk about reality since he did write the book road to reality i don't want to uh, bug him too much with these talks but um uh then we have some really good neuroscience uh uh we don't, we're gonna have something on ai but we don't have we haven't quite figured that out yet um and uh neuroscience and uh something on on pain a whole bunch of stuff actually we're about to announce the uh the first uh, the first announcement should should come out pretty soon and uh the program's uh actually coming along pretty well so that's all i can think of off the top of my head except uh oh psychedelics will be big as yeah. since uh, this is really uh, you know therapeutic applications of psychedelics uh, we're going to have um, robin carhart harris who is a rising star in this he's he's just moved to san francisco from england to uh, uh head the uh, ucsf uh center on on psychedelic uh, research and psychedelics are being used therapeutically to treat all kinds of stuff now, mental disorders, uh, dep depression, et cetera, et cetera. And some talks on, uh, on how they actually work, what do they do? And there's been some very interesting stuff recently on psychedelics and neuroplasticity, that psychedelics actually promote more synapses, more dendrites, more, uh, more outgrowths, more, more connections, and the neurons respond physically. And uh, uh, some people are trying to separate that from the psychedelic effect. Apparently, you can get it at lower concentrations. But uh, so that that's that's got to be able to tell us something about how they work and what they're actually doing. And uh, then then some other stuff. Uh, uh, so we're we're planning on you know the full, the usual uh, five uh, five or six day conference. Uh, and online it'll be online, so you don't have to sit there all day and. Uh, it should be fun. Awesome, awesome. So a few other questions, uh, more questions, uh, Stuart. So I think you already answered this question. This question was that, hey, uh, can non-life uh, forms of organization uh, be conscious and non-biological life forms be uh, conscious? I think uh, you have answered that question already, that if all those conditions exist, then you know there is no need that only biological life can be conscious. That other forms of organization, whether non-biological life forms or non-life forms, uh, yeah. if they well, arrange that's... the Bing, if they create that whole quantum coherence and that organization, then the conscious experience can be had. You don't need a, a specific substrate for that. 
Well, it, it raises the question of what is life. I mean, life is is all, almost as hard to define, or explain as consciousness. Yeah. And uh, people take people, you know, um, uh, life is. Some people define it as a, a group, a list of its functions. You know, metabolism, evolution, adaptation, homeostasis, blah blah blah. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, there's a lot of non-living systems that have have those. And not all of these systems have all of those. So those functional explanations don't really don't really help. And then there are vitalism explanations going back to the 19th century that there's some life force. Um, but electrom and some people think it's consciousness at least is electromagnetic, and maybe life is too. But that doesn't that has some problems. Uh, and then uh, there's quantum vitalism, and I'm, I, I put myself in that camp that that, conscious, that, that life is actually a quantum coherence of some some sort in these uh, pi resonance groups. I think that's the key. I mean, uh, I took I, when I wanted to go to medical school as an undergrad, and everybody said, "Well, you got to take organic chemistry; it's the course to get you into med school." And uh, so I went. I took it with some trepidation. Actually, I really enjoyed it. I found out about these pi resonance orbitals and these electron clouds and this and that. And that stuck with me. And I think that's the key. So that's the, the aromatic rings, the benzene rings that are in, uh, in the psychedelic molecules that are in the aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and so forth. Uh, in in almost all biomolecules, not all, but many biomolecules. So I think that's that's the key. Uh, to life, that there's some kind of quantum coherence among these pi resonance groups. And uh, uh, that's probably where we should be looking. Okay. And then uh, a few, few remaining questions. This question is that, hey, while uh, consciousness is more than computation, it's not computational, but it probably is material. So the question for you is, uh, whatever, we may not have the perfect understanding of material universe or matter, but do you think that consciousness being, you know, happens in some organization of matter or are you, uh, and I'm not that familiar with idealism, or are or is Stuart in the idealist non-material camp as well, where some special dimension some special extra effect is needed for consciousness based on everything that I heard. I don't think so, but I think people want to hear from you. Okay, no extra dimensions, different scales maybe, but no extra dimensions, no extra universes, no multiple worlds, anything like that. And as far as materialism, collapse, uh, at least in Roger's view, or actually any view of collapse, you start with something that's kind of immaterial, that's quantum, because it's it's smeared out like a wave and you collapse it to something material that's material materialism requires a sequence because you know i don't know how many uh, infinite almost number of collapses to create the material world and then it does it again and again and again so it's it's not the material it's the process that gives you the specific material it's the collapsed process mm and a sequence of events that, that's consciousness. Each event selects particular material states and makes a decision. I'm gonna raise my finger, I'm gonna say a certain word, I'm gonna uh, do whatever, but it's a sequence of events. And in that way, it's very much like Whitehead's uh, process philosophy of a sequence of events. And it was uh, uh, Abner Shemini who first said, hey, wait, these Whitehead occasions look a lot like quantum state reductions. And, um, and I think that's true. So it's a sequence of quantum state reductions. But the point is, you need to explain quantum state reduction. And then be, to get there, you need to explain what superposition is. So Roger did the homework. Roger started with defining superposition as, you know, separated curvatures in space time, came up with the threshold for self collapse, and concluded um, that that must be the origin of consciousness. And I remember somebody asked him, well, how did you come up with that? And he said, he paraphrased uh, Sherlock Holmes. He said, when you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left must be correct, yeah. no matter how seemingly improbable. No, to me, it seems very probable. I think, uh, is it fair to say that that process mechanism that, that, that you talked about, that it is still physical, meaning everything that you and Roger talked about, still it is physics, maybe not computation, but physics, that there is nothing... There is no uh, 
metaphysical dimension of the argument in your uh, in your theory. Yes, it's physics, not materialism, but it's what gives you materialism. It is physics, not materialism. It is physics that gives you materialism, but not metaphysical. Correct. We're trying to get the meta out of metaphysics. You're trying to get meta out of metaphysics. The very last question for today, for all the research groups, engineering teams, whether in business or in universities out there, uh, over the next 10 years or so, what type of experiments you would like them to conduct what types of avenues you would like them to pursue? Uh, what kind of goals you would like these teams to set for themselves, whether they are trying to find neural sort of, you know, science way to understand consciousness, whether computer engineers trying to uh, do artificial conscious engineering. So if you were to, sir, uh, kind of state your ideal roadmap for all collaborators on planet Earth who are interested in this area, you know, whether universities or, uh, or companies or other forms of organizations or their collaborations, what kind of roadmap you can give? Uh, and then I think the other thinking is that people say, well, it is a loaded question. It would be great if Stuart can come up with a roadmap and kind of even uh, promote and publicize it uh, in his conference. But for now, at least, uh, as our last question, uh, your vision that, hey, at least these are the different swim lanes or, you know, uh, sort of progress, uh, sort of themes that people should pursue. What would you say? Well, I would say, as I said earlier, organic molecules, uh, uh, graphene, uh, fullerenes, uh, buckyballs, uh, these polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, try to make, uh, you know, develop them. And a lot of people are doing this. This is probably going to be a huge industry um, if it isn't already uh, for all kinds of sensors uh, and uh, uh, look for terahertz oscillations, which are probably the, the root of the biology. Ter uh, develop better terahertz sensors using graphene because right now we don't have good terahertz sensors. Um, they're kind of in the gap, and that may be why we're not hearing from ET because we're not uh, looking in the, in the right frequency range. Um, but um, putting that aside, uh, again, organic molecules uh, with, with graphene and, of course, microtubule research. Uh, Anur Bandhyapadhyay, he's just come out with some amazing uh, results from neurons. He published in Journal of Neurophysiology showing that uh, that the frequency in the in the cytoskeleton determines which branch of an axon is going to fire, for example. And it's not just the membrane ions, it's, it's what's going on at a deeper level. So two things, um, look inside the neuron to the, to the microtubules, particularly in the dendrites and soma, where there are these mixed polarity networks, and look for, look for quantum effects and quantum computing and, and uh, sensing in graphene and similar materials. And this one is just my very last question for uh, today. Uh, how would we know if a machine is conscious? What would be a Turing test for consciousness? And then if one day uh, we are able to create conscious machines, then what do you think are the ethical dilemmas or questions that we would have to think if we believe that a machine has feelings, has an inner subjective life, and they can feel pain or you know other other forms. So first, how do we even know? Uh, because certainly it is easier for us to mimic or fool as software engineers. We can make behaviorally a robot report. Yeah, I'm having this feeling, you know, and uh, you know, you you kick it and it will scream and that kind of a thing. But how would we truly know that it is having that feeling when we ourselves? Uh, you know, it is hard to understand each other's consciousness. Uh, we even don't give uh, it. It's my own point of view that most animals have some form of consciousness. They have that being going. Their contents may be different, but we don't attribute, you know, any conscious rights to even other fellow uh, life creatures on Earth. So 
your sort of, you know, the, I know this is a philosophical very last question, but your thoughts on how do we, how would we even know that some other form of organization is conscious, whether we make it or it comes to us, whatever. And then how should we think about, uh, you know, a framework in which we extend uh, rights and we ask ethical questions as well. And I think that would be a great way to, uh, Stuart, bring our conversation uh, today to a closure. Yeah, you saved the toughest question for last. Okay. Uh, well, like you said, I, I don't know for sure you're conscious. I think you are. You certainly act conscious. And similarly, you know, I'm, I could be a cleverly programmed uh, robot uh, programmed to talk about consciousness when I don't have any, but I can assure you I do. Um, I, I, I would say if you have a, an artificial system, if it, at least if it's, if it's uh, graphene based, something like that, as I said, uh, does it go away with, does the effect go away with anesthesia? I think, uh, you know, until we hear otherwise, anesthesia, the, going away with anesthesia is the best test we have for consciousness. Um, so uh, that would be, that would be uh, probably the best way. And as far as if they are, if they are conscious or we suspect they're conscious, uh, all we can do is treat them kindly. Uh, I just wrote a paper with Alison Watry about testing for consciousness in cerebral organoids, these stem cell derived mini brains and how they might be conscious. They have phase coupling, EEG and so forth. So in the end we say, we don't know, but just be nice to them, treat them as if they were just like we treat, we should treat each other. Stuart, sir, thank you for being so gracious with your time today. This was super fun. Thank you, Amjad. Appreciate it very much. Good luck to you and everybody and uh, hope to see you down the road somewhere.